So George, you've done a lot of work on Abraham Lincoln, and I can remember attending three of your public lectures on Lincoln, one of them on the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, which you ended by expressing from the heart a sense of gratitude for the life of Lincoln and what he accomplished. Uh, that made a great impression upon me, because lecturers often don't speak that way. Um, but that Emancipation Proclamation, um, which was issued in the beginning of 1863, uh, um, is bracketed at the other end of the year by his uh, Gettysburg Address in November of 1863. And I wanted to ask you something about the Gettysburg Address. Uh, he closes that probably most famous of his speeches by saying that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. What do you think he means by new birth of freedom? Yes, well, the, the contention that we're in the war inaugurating a new birth of freedom uh, carries along with it the implication that something's happened to the, to the old freedom. Mm -hmm. You know, it's died or perhaps that the, um, the birthing of that freedom was somehow insufficient. And so um, we, in the war, were somehow bringing about another birth, a new birth. And I think that Lincoln also means something better. And I, and I think he, he I think he means it in both in, in the sense of, you know, greater quantity of freedom. Certainly more people are going to be freed, um, but, but also a better quality of freedom that, that will all be better off. It's interesting you say all. So you're talking not just about the freeing or the emancipating of the slaves, but of the white population too? Yeah, I guess that's what I mean by saying that and it also is a qualitative difference, this, this new birth of freedom, because now the citizens of the country who have for a long time thought that there was something wrong with the institution of enslavement in a country that called itself free, now those people don't have to carry um, the the responsibility that that they were carrying and some of them some of them were carrying it very openly and explicitly the, the there were people who were calling for the end of the institution mm -hmm. so the the image of birth in that phrase also interests me new birth of freedom i mean given the context lincoln speaking at the dedication of a cemetery after a horrific battle of i don't know how many Thousands of men died there, yeah, Ten, uh, tens of thousands. Well, yeah, we don't have enough. Yeah, but that he speaks there so of right. birth, of you know, of bringing new life into the nation, while at the same time saying the dead shall not have died in vain. We are dedicated to that, meaning there's going to be a continued process. Uh, uh, fighting of this war until final victory is had, and that will mean more death. So we're going to fight this war, we're going to win it, uh, despite the pictures of all the dead that the, you're seeing in the newspapers, and that will give a new birth of freedom. So what do you make of that, that sort of stunning juxtaposition that he's you know, proclaiming to the nation? This is what we're going to do. 
Yes, and that that has to do with the, um, I think, the conceit of that speech. I mean, Lincoln wants to um, let people know how he understood the founding of the country, and 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 he he describes that founding um, as 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 a birth four score and seven years ago. Our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. And, and there he's, he's trying to say, I really, I, Abraham Lincoln, really think that the country was founded in 1776. That's the 87 years. Um, before 1863 brings us back to 1776. So he's, he's saying to um, his audience now of many centuries, he's saying, um, we were founded on the principle of, of freedom. Mm -hmm. and, and I know that there are, there are people who uh, take issue with that. Um, they say, well, he talks about being founded on the principle of equality. We weren't founded on the principle of, of equality. Um, but when Lincoln talks about equality, he makes it plain in a number of speeches that what he means by equality um, is, is not equality of possession or equality of goods or anything like that. What he means by that is that we're all equal in respect of um, owning and, and deserving the fruits of our labor. Could you clarify a little more what the distinction is between freedom and equality, a nation founded on the principle of freedom versus founded on the principle of equality? Uh, I would, would have thought just on reading the Declaration of Independence, that they're kind of wrapped up together. You know, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal. That comes first. That they are endowed with, you know, these certain inalienable rights. And then we hear liberty, you know, right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So, Yeah, I guess they contend with each other when you have to think about uh, the meaning of of freedom over against the meaning of, of equality. Because I mean, if, you, um, if you think about freedom um, in the sense of the citizenry being able to um, exhaust, if you will, their capacities, their, their sort of native capacities, then that um, can and does bring about a kind of inequality. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm very good at um, making money, however I make the money, if I'm very good at it, and you're not so good at it, why, um, before too long, we're not going to be equal in, 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 certain, in certain respects. And of course, we know that somebody like Marx is very, very uh, mm -hmm. keen on, on talking about that, that yeah. kind of, of, of inequality. Um, so, so there are people who, when they see Lincoln saying uh, that the country was dedicated to the proposition that, that all men are created equal, they somehow read that as Lincoln thinking that the principle of equality trumps mm -hmm. the, the principle of freedom in, in the founding of the country. Okay. But I, I, don't, I don't think that. I, and there's, there's a moment, there's actually a moment where I think Lincoln, um, in, in the speech that he gave in New Haven, Connecticut, sort of um, spoke to his... Um, spoke to his um, opinion on, on this. 
Um, so, um, because there he talks about, he talks about himself. He talks about himself for a little bit, and then he he talks about the situation as he understands it of the black Americans. And when is this speech being delivered? This speech is being delivered in March of 1860. 1860. When, when Lincoln was um, campaigning. It was subsequent to um, a speech, a better known speech, the, spe the Cooper Institute. I don't, yeah, I don't think I know that speech, so I'm interested to hear. Yeah, yeah here, we, here we go. He says, <clears throat> one of the reasons why I am opposed to slavery is just here. What is the true condition of the laborer? I take that it is best for all to leave each man free to acquire property as fast as he can. Some will get wealthy. I don't believe in a law to prevent a man from getting rich. It would do more harm than good. So while we do not propose any war upon capital, we do wish to allow the humblest man an equal chance to get rich with everybody else. When one starts poor, as most do in the race of life, Free society is such that he knows he can better his condition. He knows that there is no fixed condition of labor for his whole life. I am, I am not ashamed to confess that 25 years ago, I was a hired laborer mauling rails at work on a flatboat, just what might happen to any poor man's son. I want every man to have the chance, and I believe a black man is entitled to it, in which he can better his conditions, his condition, when he may look forward and hope to be a hired laborer this year and the next, work for himself afterward, and finally, to hire men to work for him. That is the true system. Wow. So Lincoln found his way into uh, understanding something about the horror of slavery through the question of labor, of work, and of getting you know, the rewards uh, from one's own labors to uh, better one's own condition. That was his way in, in other words, to understanding this problem. Yes, I think so. I, I think he he likened um, the situation um, of the planters in the South who were enslaving um, human beings to tyranny. He said, this, in his mind, there was there's no difference that you know, the under the tyrant. Um, you work and the tyrant enjoys the fruits of your labor under the system of enslavement. You work and the, the plantation owners enjoy the fruit of your labor. It was, it was just that. I mean, in a way, it's the, it's the Lockean principle. He yeah, thinks yeah. that this is how, this is how property comes into existence. You mix your labor with the, the substance of nature and what, the result is your is yours and yours alone. Yeah, that seems consistent in his speeches to the very end. In the second inaugural, he mentions, it may seem strange that any man should dare to ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces. There it is again, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. That's, that's the key issue of justice and what's wrong with uh, uh, with this institution of slavery, do you think um, do you think that's right? Does that go deep enough? Does that is that um, an understanding of slavery that is consistent with, say, the founding principles? 
of Jefferson and with what you know, the meaning of that war is captured in the phrase new birth of freedom. Well, we know, we know for a fact, and I think Lincoln himself was, was aware of this, we know for a fact that uh, the ending of the institution of enslavement, which, which meant uh, or, or seemed to mean on its face that uh, the, the fruits of a man's labor would no longer be expropriated. We know for a fact that that just didn't happen, mm -hmm. that um, in the country, um, black Americans uh, continued to labor and be stripped of the fruits of their labor in, in various ways. So um, there, there was that. We also know, and, and, and um, we also know that, that even when that wasn't happening, that black Americans did not enjoy the same kind of social freedom that mm -hmm. that many white Americans uh, many white Americans enjoyed, and that was a problem. That was a problem that came up mm -hmm. even before um, Lincoln was was president, because um, his old associate from Illinois, Stephen Douglas, was always. Um, suggesting that because Lincoln thought that um, the system of enslavement should be ended, that that meant that he wanted to elevate the uh, black Americans socially. And, and Lincoln was honest enough to say, no, that's not what I, that's not what I mean. I, I, I don't, and, and, and he was very honest about it. He said, not only do I not think that, I'm not interested in doing that because I can't think that you can do that. I don't think that you can successfully make people uh, okay, so the new social birth of, equals. The new birth of freedom was not to include social equality. That's right. In, in Lincoln's mind, that was something that could only happen in the course of time. Mm -hmm. he, didn't, he didn't imagine that you could legislate it into, into mm -hmm. existence. I wanted to ask you another thing about that phrase, though, new birth of freedom. It suggests to me as well that with every human birth, at any time, white or black, rich or poor, there is this question or this, this challenge that freedom needs to be born again in that person's life as, as an achievement. Do you think that's going too far in, in, you know, interpreting the meaning of that phrase? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, there's, there's always a lot of equivocating going on when people, when people talk about freedom. So, so we have to be careful when we're thinking about, when we're thinking about freedom and, and, and talking about it, we have to be careful to say you know, the sense in which we're talking about it. So, I think that Lincoln and others were uh, very much responsible for bringing about the end of the institution of enslavement. And that meant that they had a hand in um, black Americans um, coming, coming out from under the um, Authority and, and the the tyranny of of some of some white Americans, and it just, just seems to me that that's undeniable. Mm -hmm. and, and the the war that began as a so-called war for the Union, war to preserve the Union, um, in fairly short order. By the time we get to January of eighteen sixty three becomes a war to end the institution of, of enslavement. And, and, and Lincoln, again, is, is somebody who's really honest about this. He knew fully well in 1861 that he could not fight the war as a war to end the institution of enslavement because he would not have had the support of 
the American people. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about that union and freedom. Are you suggesting that those that with the Emancipation Proclamation, the meaning of the war changes and it's not so much union, it's it's emancipation? Or do the two of those go together as you know, just inextricable parts of yeah. when, when, we were, when we were talking about union, honestly speaking, we were always talking about freedom and hence the institution of slavery. Well, one of the things that Lincoln believed, and I, I, I think that, that he was right myself, is that uh, the institution of enslavement was only going to end if the union remained intact. There were plenty of people in the 19th century, the late 19th century, certainly, who were calling for um, the uh, government to just let the Southerners go their way. Mm. And so we would have two countries and they could have their institution if they wanted it. So Lincoln thought, well, no, we ought to preserve the union. It's a great union. And that means we ought to um, end the institution of enslavement. Now, he couldn't do it legally. That's why he said, I can't fight to, to, to end the institution. Um, but he, he did, at a certain point in time, fairly well known, I think, but maybe not so much, September 22nd, 1862, after the battle here of Antietam, here in Maryland, also I think called the Battle of Sharpsburg mm -hmm. by some. He gives the, the, the Southerners a, a, an ultimatum. Well, I guess, depending on how you look at it, it you, you, some people might call it a deal. He says, I'll, I'll make a deal with you. Uh, if you just put your arms down now, uh, and stop the fight, we'll go back to the status quo antebellum. We'll go back to the situation that we had um, before the fighting mm -hmm. began. And he said, I'll give you 100 days to think about it. And if, if after 100 days you don't lay down your arms, then I'm going to issue um, a proclamation emancipating the human beings enslaved in the, in the states in rebellion, say. And the Southerners, the Southerners rolled the dice, decided that they weren't going to accept that, that deal. Wow. And so he issues, he, he's true to his word, and he issues the, the proclamation. Now, again, there are people who will say, well, you know, what was that? And uh, he's, he's freed the enslaved people in the states in rebellion. Well, there were people who were enslaved in some of the states that remained, the so-called border states that remained loyal to, to the Union. So he really didn't end the institution of slavery. But mm -hmm. I think that that's really um, not uh, assessing, assessing things um, the way they were. If... It, well, it was it was the case at that time that the overwhelming majority of enslaved people in the country, totaling somewhere between three and a half and four million people, um, the overwhelming majority were in the states in rebellion. Yeah. So if those if those people were all freed, it was going to be very difficult for the people in the border states who were holding property and human beings, it was going to be very difficult for them to continue to do that. And they knew it. Mm. Um, again, it's, it, you know, historically, we know that a huge howl went up. Um, and in the probably states. louder, most, most, uh, most loudly in the border states when the Emancipation Proclamation was issued. They knew. The writing's on the wall. That. So, George, what you were just saying about the aftermath of Antietam and Lincoln's ultimatum to the South and his apparent willingness to go back to the antebellum period of union, of slave and free, does make me wonder about 
uh, his faith in the people, that he really has an extraordinary faith in the people. At the end of the Gettysburg Address, you know, we hear that word three times, of the people, by the people, for the people. And even if that means that among the people are these slaveholders, that union with them um, is a good thing because there's something about the people that he trusts will you know, prevail over time for the good. Do you think that's right? Yes, I do. I, but, I, but I think it's right because it, it's part of his agreement, if you will, um, with the founders, uh, Madison, Lincoln, Jay, Jefferson, and, and others. They, too, had... Um, some sense of faith in, in the people. And we know from the earliest years of the, the Union that there was a lot of arguing going on there, and mm -hmm. some people wanted more government, and, but others wanted less. And one of the, one of the uh, or two of the great people who sometimes argued for, for less government are people like Madison and... Mm -hmm. um, and and Jefferson. So so and and I like to uh, put the emphasis on that um, in, at the at the end of at the end of the Gettysburg Address. No, what, what does he say? He says, um, let me see if I can find that here. I should have this marked off. But I do you want you would like sure. me to read the end? Um, yeah. So he says that um, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. And so I, I, that's, that's how I hear, that's how I hear the, the end of that speech is um, Lincoln saying that. But he's saying, that, he's saying it going back to the very beginning um, in accordance with what we get in the Declaration of Independence because he sees the Declaration of Independence as a kind of beacon for the people. See, I don't think, mm -hmm. I don't think yep. that Lincoln believed that this struggle that the country was going through regarding enslavement was the final struggle for freedom, that mm -hmm. this new birth was going to be the last new birth. I think he understood fully that, no, there will be other people okay. who will um, find themselves not enjoying the kind of freedom that they should. That brings me back to, to a question I was thinking about before, that the new birth of freedom understood as an individual's experience is something that everyone must bring about in their own life. So Lincoln, maybe through his work as a day laborer, his self-education, you know, his mastery of the English language, uh, learned how to free himself in a certain way. Um, Certainly in the autobiography of Frederick Douglass, we get a, a very vivid and moving picture of someone who, who more or less explicitly says, you know, this is how I freed myself from slavery. So um, do you think that, that would these two men provide an example of what everyone has to do? Yeah, and here, here's, a, again, another one of those places where I think that we, we need to be clear about what we're talking about when we talk about freedom. Because and I think, I think both Lincoln and Douglas understood this very well, that um, you, you could be enslaved or you could be free in the sense of having your labor expropriated or having your movements monitored or, or severely restricted. But even if you're free in that sense, that is to say you enjoy the fruits of your labor and you're free to move about wherever you would, would like to go, 
even if you have that sort of, of freedom, there may be another way in which you're enslaved. And, and, and how does that go? Well, you're born into a society. I mean, the Southerners in the 19th century um, would say, look, we didn't in invent this institution. See, this institution had been here for a couple of centuries when we came onto the scene, you see. But the question for them is, well, what are you willing to do to get out from under? What are you willing to do to get out from under the notion that some human beings are better than other human beings? And better to the extent that they should be able to own those human beings and mm -hmm. to expropriate their, their labor mm -hmm. uh, when, as, as, they, as they wish. Um, are you willing to, to give up that notion? And, and I think that that's a kind of freedom that a lot of people don't enjoy. Mm -hmm. I think there are plenty of people who are uh, held in bonds by authoritative opinions that are not good ones. And, and so, um, that's a different kind of, of freeing. And I think that Lincoln and, and Frederick Douglass both were men who, ex who experienced that very, very, that difference very keenly. Yeah, so now we're talking about very deeply held opinions and prejudices about you know, who I am, who you are. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between us? Um, I mean, so, I'm reading Douglas's autobiography, I mean, it's one of the reasons it's so impressive to me is because it seems to me he's trying to say to the reader that I, a black man, a former slave, am a human being just like you. And what I experienced is in some way unspeakable. You know, the whippings he describes of his Aunt Hester and, you know, the shootings and, and and on and on, though unspeakable, and you've never had anything like it happen to you. Nevertheless, I can build a bridge, and we can meet on it as human, as equal human beings. Do you think that's right? That's the burden of the book, to create that that new understanding of who he is, and who his reader is, who, who his readers are. That is, to use Lincoln's phrase, they're, of, they're the same people mm -hmm. in this one country. You know, to put it more simply, is Douglas's path to freedom, learning to read, learning to write, fighting back against someone who wants to whip him, Mr. Covey, um, into you know, a bestial state, uh, that that's, that's a kind of paradigm for anyone's achievement of freedom. Well, sure. I, I mean, there, I, I suppose I think that that's a kind of bottom line issue having to do with um, being, being held physically, being, being enslaved in a physical sense. Covey was, was trying to break him as one might break a wild horse and, and, and knock the spirit out of him. Um, and he was, he was unable to do that. Um, Although Douglas himself says he came, he came pretty close to to doing it. No, but I'm I'm talking about uh, something something else and something I think that more human beings experience. You you get out into the world. You grow up. You become yourself to a certain extent. Um, you become yourself and the context of this world that's given to you by your parents and your earliest teachers. And that means that you have a certain view of things, that you have certain opinions about the way the world is, the way the human beings in, in the world are. Um, and, and so that, that may require that uh, you have some work to do on yourself. Why? Because the view of the world that you may have inherited may be very cloudy. You, you, may, you may not see the world the way 
the world re really is. And, and in the first place, you have to somehow be awakened to that fact that um, I, I really don't see the world as clearly as mm. as I as I could. And and if that happens to you, if you're awakened to that, then you have to undertake another kind of education on yourself. And and, and I'm calling that other kind of education. You have to you have to go about freeing yourself because you're really you're really being held in bondage. How do you these, do that? Um, well, I suppose in a way you do what we're doing here at the college. <laughs> You yeah. go to school, you start reading books, you start meeting other people. I, I, I think I can, I can think uh, of people who have come uh, into rooms where I've been sitting and are meeting a, a black man who's very different from what they've been told about, about black men, about black Americans. And, and, and I'm sure maybe they think, Wow, I did. I didn't. I didn't think that there would be a black man in here doing this. Mm. No. Um, so, so that that sort of thing. I didn't think that there would be a Jewish man in here who was, you know, concerned about the things that this, these Jewish men that I I see are are concerned about. I mean, this this just has to do with the world that that this or that human being happens to grow up in and the opinions that they, they, they happen to absorb. So now it sounds like what you're talking about is indeed something we do at the college. I mean, I mean in a way the word, the common word now is you know, diversity, but to encounter differences of, of opinion and of belief and of practice and to be surprised at finding things you never expected to find there. I mean, in the case of Douglas, I mean, he when he started learning to read, he discovered, surprisingly, words, simple, just words for things he never knew were in him. And and I think that goes on at the college, too, when, in our reading, right? That we discover, it's not just in other people, like meeting a black man who's different from my pre-existing image of him, but you know, one meets oneself in in works that one reads and is surprised to discover that new self. Um, and Douglas is surprised to discover that uh, that this new power of awareness and of speech and of recognition has made the condition of slavery that much more unbearable. Because now he knows, you know, what it means to be a human being. Well, now, now he knows something about what it means to be a human being because when because his his education is going to continue after after he's quote unquote free, um, and 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 it's that continuance that is, in a way, the continuance of his his um, emancipation. But it's a continuance that can only be achieved by Douglas himself. And, and I'm saying that for any human being, that's true. Mm -hmm. That you, if you really want to be free from these opinions about the world and about human beings that you've inherited, that you have to want that, you, you have to see something of the limitations of those authoritative opinions that, that you have in your life. And, and, and when you see those limitations, you have to um, decide that you want to somehow move, move beyond those opinions. Let me ask, let me, shift, let me shift ground just a bit to um, uh, Plato's Republic, because um, it occurred to me a moment ago uh, when you first started talking about freeing yourself from prejudices, from opinions, from the way things have always been done. Um, the Republic begins with a conversation between Socrates and a very old man, um, Cephalus, um, and 
the question of justice arises in that conversation. And shortly after the question arises, the old man leaves in order to perform sacrifices because he's worried about you know, dying in a good disposition towards the gods. And then the young men take over the conversation. And that, that suggests that to explore the question of justice, which becomes a question of how to live one's life, uh, the young men to free themselves uh, from the opinions of the old, which have maybe ruled their lives, have to engage Socrates, who's also an old man, on their own, without Kephalus there, starting from scratch. Yeah. It's one of the sad moments in the Republic. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Kephalus you, going yeah. off. Well, I mean, I, I think that's it's, it's true yeah. because Kephalus, of course, he has this opinion that justice is uh, repaying what one owes. What one owes, yeah. And, and Socrates sort of makes short work of it um, by uh, bringing up a certain example about um, whether or not you should always repay the thing that is owed. What if the person uh, to whom you owe it is mad? Exactly. And uh, you owe them a gun thing. or something. Yeah. And, and so it goes off, but it, it just occurs to me, though, that, or I didn't say it just occurs to me, but it occurs to me that uh, Kephalus's opinion has much, much more weight to it than, than we see. And it comes back again. It comes back again much later in the, uh, in the, in the dialogue. But what, because Kephalus's opinion just doesn't have to do with some simple um, lifeboat experience. What if the man is insane or whatever? But it, it has to do with a way of looking at the world. Mm -hmm. Because when Kephalus looks at the world, he sees a world of debtors and creditors. He thinks that's the way it is with us human beings. We, we either owe or we're owed or we're just living in some kind of matrix of, of, of owing and, and being owed. And he's saying in that world, justice is making sure that you pay back your debts. And, and in fact, I think that a lot of the way we live our lives is like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at, when the holidays come at the end of the year and I know that, you know, I have to go back to New York to visit my, my old mother and some, my father when he was alive. And I didn't feel like doing that, but I would go. Uh, but why? Because I owed. That's what I thought. Well, I really owe it to him. I should, I should go. And we owe a lot of things. We just don't owe money. We, we owe, we owe respect and we, we owe sometimes honor and, and, and we owe love, yeah. you know, um, and, and so this is, this is Kephalus's thought that that's, that that's what justice is. And when you don't do that, when you don't, you know, make those payments and make them properly and on time, that, that you're, you're being unjust. That all makes sense that his opinion has to be, you know, given serious consideration. It does come back later. But no, it comes back yeah. later at a very important, yeah. let me just say this quickly, at a very important moment in book seven, when um, Socrates and Glaucon are talking about whether the philosopher has to return to the cave. Yeah. Does he? And um, Does he so owe the city Socrates anything? says that, well, it, if the city has educated him to philosophy as the city in speech, then yeah, he has to go back because he owes. Mm -hmm. And it says in the actual cities, that's not true because the actual cities don't educate anybody to philosophy, but not, not in that city. So in any case, I mean, Socrates still seems to um, yeah. see the importance of that. But you wanted to talk about what yeah, happens I just with Polemarchus. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I had two things in mind. Okay. One that is just a simple observation that um, for freeing conversations to happen, like the kind we have at the college that we were mentioning. 
I mean, that, that, they would be inconceivable if the students' parents were sitting in on, in the classes. You know, they, there's some way in which the young need to be, while respectful and, and take seriously the opinions of the old, can't be dominated by the very presence of the old while the freeing is happening. That, um, but the other thing is, I mean, the challenge posed by, say, Thersimachus, that if you want to be free, if you want to free yourself, you need power, and then you can do what you want and call it justice. Because uh, that, that emerges once Cephalus is gone and Polymarchus is, um, Polymarchus's opinions about justice are handled by Socrates. He gets him to agree that the just man doesn't do harm to anyone. And then Thrasymachus enters and says, this is just a bunch of drivel. We're talking like children. You know, we all know how it really works, what life is really like. You know, you need to get the power to be free. And ultimately, that means a tyrant. A tyrant is the free, mighty, happy man. It's an extraordinary, you know, movement. Uh, yeah, I suppose that when you think about freedom in that way, I should be able to do what I, whatever it is I want. You're, you're going to have um, a lot of trouble in a country of a people who have who hold that opinion. And obviously, we can't all do what we want because we're we're just going to be in a network of chaos. Mm -hmm. Maybe we're coming to a network of chaos. I don't know, but <laughs> um, but yeah. I mean, so so that's in my mind. That's clearly. Um, so in an adequate sense of what freedom must be, um, unless, like Persimachus, you um, think that uh, tyranny is okay, and 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 you can be the tyrant. You can be the tyrant. Uh, yeah. Then, then. I don't think Persimachus thinks everyone should have this kind of liberty, but he should. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, I mean, but in my mind, the, the person who, and I think a lot of the Republic is, is about this, the person who is um, acquainted with this opinion or, or comes to an awareness of it um, needs a certain kind of education, and that's the kind of education I think that Glaucon and Ad Adimantus are getting from Socrates in, in the Republic to, mm -hmm. to somehow wean them away from the authoritative opinion of somebody like Thrasymachus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is interesting, I, I just recall now that Frederick Douglass uh, has a transformative moment when in reading in the Columbian Orator, after he learns how to read, he reads a kind of Socratic dialogue between a master and a slave in which the slave, through this sort of question and answer, actually persuades the master to voluntarily free him. Do so you think that that's happening in Plato's dialogues, that in the best of cases, say with Glaucon and Adiamantus, they are learning to be free? I mean, I, I in a sense, yes. I think that because they know, especially Glaucon, they know this opinion that um, Thrasymachus has. They've heard him before, and uh, and they've heard these kinds of opinions before, and um, they. But they haven't known how to. They haven't known how to combat the opinion, and and I think that that's what they're. I think that's what they're getting from from Socrates in yeah. how to combat the Persimachuses of the world. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You know, it, but it's one thing to sort of acquire new opinions, right opinions about how to live one's life freely and justly. It's another thing to actually live it. Yeah. Um, 
There's that wonderful moment, and I think it's in the Gorgias, when Callicles is persuaded by Socrates of something, uh, you know, maybe similar to what we get in the Republic, that you should, you know, that you should not do harm to your, even to your enemies. Um, and Callicles says uh, something like, well, I have to agree with the argument, Socrates, but I'm not going to live that way. I mean, that's mm -hmm. another matter altogether. Um, so, th I mean, that in a way brings me back to where we started, George, with Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, which are words and opinions about America, but spoken on a battlefield where tremendous bloody deeds have been performed. And he says in the address itself that that's what really matters. You know, my words, I mean, this is ironic. You know, my words will be forgotten, but their deeds will never be forgotten. So I was wondering, what do you think about that? This, this relation between words or arguments, speeches, and the deeds that actually make up one's life. Well, yeah, there's a kind of living irony in, in the speech in that way, because I, I think as years go by and uh, decades go by that we still are attending to Lincoln's words. But I think what happened on the battlefield is, is being forgotten. Because the strangest thing that happened in that war, uh, is that uh, hundreds of thousands of, of Americans, the overwhelming majority of which were white, hundreds of thousands of uh, American lives were lost in a war that, uh, in the course of things, came to end the institution of, of enslavement. And that's the thing that um, I think uh, is lost on many people today. Why do you think that is? Why is that being forgotten? Well, I mean, well, one, going back to something that, that I said earlier, because the, the sort of uh, emancipation, the, what I might call the bodily or physical emancipation of the enslaved people uh, did not uh, lead to um, genuine uh, freedom, uh, e even freedom on the, the bodily scale. That suggests, I mean, one way of framing it is, a prob is, a, is in terms of memory and maybe the study of history and you know, what's going on in America in, in that respect. But maybe another way of putting it is in terms of honesty. And it, it seems to me, tell me what you think about this, that in America today, talking about race, is it's very hard to do that, honestly. Why is that? Well, I, I think that there are a number of reasons for that. One, I mean, just going back to the ending of the institution in the 19th century, is that it ended legally without really um, bringing about the intended result, that is, the living freedom of black Americans. And so a century, basically a century later, um, the civil rights movement that we're familiar with um, springs up after um, many decades of legal segregation. Mm -hmm. And at least four decades from, say, 1880 to 1920, when uh, lynching primarily of black Americans um, was, was going on at a horrific clip. And from 1880 to 1920, there were almost 4,000 lynchings in the country. And the overwhelming majority of those, at least over 35, 3,600 of them, were lynchings of, of black Americans. So, so that's the, the, the old problem of enslavement sort of changes uh, 
into these other problems, the problems of people and uh, th their lives just being disrespected the way they're disrespected when you're talking about 40 years where on average a mm -hmm. hundred people are being lynched a year. And, and, and then the, the, the horrible system of segregation and, and trying, to, trying to get out from under that. So, so the old problem of enslavement just changes into um, to newer and, 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 and newer problems. And today, you know, we, we, we struggle with um, many black Americans uh, not um, enjoying um, the American lives um, that um, you know, other Americans, other Americans well, that, do enjoy. That suggests that Lincoln's words, you know, that we, we resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain are very apt, are, are continued to have, you know, continued to be apt long after they were spoken, because it's not just about winning the war, but about, as you're saying, that new birth of freedom being, you know, not a deformed birth, but a, a real birth. Yes, I, I mean, and I do think that there, there has been a sense of, um, a sense in which those, the lives of those men and to not go by in vain. I only think that um, the work has not yet finished. I mean, in the same way that Lincoln could say um, that the, the, the work of the founding was not done, I think that we can say the work of emancipating black Americans has has not yet um, been completed. Could one say more generally that the work of freeing oneself is never finished? Well, I mean that's that's true, but I but I think that the problem is is that when you are sort of suffering in the way that that people do suffer. Um, then it's harder to move on to that task of, of um, you know, freeing, freeing yourself. And I mean, I, I do, I, the problem really has, has sort of shifted in, in, a, in a way that's, that may be new, because I don't want to, I, I don't want to portray black Americans as being mere victims of this, the old historical uh, situation, um, or even mere victims in the present time, because I do believe that many black Americans today still manage to have um, lives that are free and, and, and good, and, and, and they, do, they do quite well, uh, thank you. But I do know that at the same time that there are uh, you know, too many black Americans who, uh, I mean, I'm talking about people who are working, who are treated unfairly by banks. I'm talking about a justice system and a prison system in which um, black Americans um, you know, suffer inordinately in comparison with, with white Americans. Um, <clears throat> And, and, and just situations where socially, um, you know, they, they may not be um, you know, quite as free as, as, they, as they ought to be. So both of those things are happening at the same time. Do I think that black Americans are, are mere victims and are not free in that sense? No, I don't. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to say, oh, well, that means that they enjoy the same kind of freedoms as, as any other Americans. I mean, another problem, though, that complicates things, too, is that the country changed uh, in terms of its white American population, because many Americans today are not 
many white Americans today are not descendants of the, uh, the folks who were around in the 19th century, but they have come over in these waves of, of immigration in the late 19th century and in, into the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And that complicates things because those uh, Americans are saying, well, I don't, what do I have to do with what happened you know, even before I was here and my mm -hmm. ancestors were not those, those people. So that's, that's another thing that, mm -hmm. that, that complicates, that complicates matters. Um, yeah. Well, perhaps I should thank you for this discussion. As I think for me, a sign of, uh, what I would like to see happen, uh, in the future, you know, honest conversation about Lincoln, about Douglas, about slavery, about what it means to be an American. Thank you, George. My pleasure.